Seminar at the Sammy Benton Campsite, right along the shores of the Connecticut River in Maidstone, Vermont, where we've been working towards a, uh, a good system for human waste management. And it's been an evolving system, uh, but I feel like we've nailed it. <laughs> we will see in a year. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to uh, Abe, who uh, is, is one of the uh, driving forces behind this particular design. Right. Well, this yeah, this is a an adaptation of my my normal design is for a is for a home. I install these mostly in people's residences, but that usually involves a basement where the composter goes, and then the, a commode in the bathroom. And since this is all um, all at the campsite on ground level, we had to adapt it. So you can see this blue container over here is just like it looks. It's a um, it's a a plastic recycling container, but this is a extra sturdy one. Um, that has no um, no metal that can be corroded inside of it, and that is the the heart of it is this composter, and it's not just a bin. It, I'll show you the parts inside in a in a minute, um, but it's got some some um, parts for air movement and for liquid movement. But when you're at the campsite, this is what you encounter: these gorgeous uh, stone steps these guys just built today. You walk up them. There there will be a privacy screen around here in the future, but I haven't got that up yet. This is the seat you sit on it like you would sit on a normal toilet. And, um, and it's at a, you know, a comfortable height. The, the, the tank is big, but the way it's set up with these, um, with these blocks, you just sit normally, use it normally. That and looks so comfortable. The only, only thing different is the view. <laughs> Gorgeous Connecticut River. Um, and so the, the other thing that's different actually is after you use the toilet, which you'd use like any toilet, afterwards you'll add a small scoop of wood shavings or shredded bark into, into the composter. And that's what really makes it a composting toilet because you have, on, on the one hand, the human manure, like any animal manure, manure can compost, but it needs to be mixed with other things, in this case, wood shavings or, or bark. And, um, and we're waiting to see how long it takes to fill, but with, we think that with the usage at this site, it'll, um, it'll, take, it'll, it'll, it'll be enough capacity for the whole season. What is also in the back here that's not visible yet is this port for a vent pipe. Composting toilets don't um, don't have to have any any particular odor to them if they're well ventilated and, and well uh, well cared for. And so in this system, the ventilation is going to be a four-inch pipe leading up to above the height of the building, and that will allow the um, the odors from the composting process to go up through. And when I say odors from composting process, I really mean that it's not an odor of sewage or of outhouse. When you uh, when you have wood shavings or bark mulch mixed in it is actually a, a composty smell like you might um, like you might have in a in a backyard compost pile something like that um, but but even so it's nice to have those odors whisked away if we look over this other bin you can see what's inside it these um, these two bins are identical that one is underneath the uh, the green seat this one is um, is open and you can see that in the bottom it's not just the bottom of the bin. This is the, the critical difference of, of uh, just having a trash can or having a composting toilet system. This has an elevated floor that's perforated and it's held up by a sturdy grid um, a few inches off the bottom of the floor so that any excess liquid in the compost can drain through into that, that area underneath it. That keeps the compost from getting too, too soggy. And if it's too soggy, it won't compost properly. And then if you look on the outside here, we've got two air inlets. There's two others on the other side. So plenty of air can get into this underfloor space. The floor is right about here. So air can diffuse in from the outside and then work its way up through the entire compost. Meanwhile, any excess liquid, if, if there is some, will be draining through the floor, collecting in the bottom. And then this fitting um, hooks up with this quick, this quick easy on, easy off connection to a drain. Because if there's excess liquid, we need to drain that out of the container. And depending on the setting, That'll either go into a um, in ground, like a like a little mini baby leach field, or if it's in a setting where um, where you can't, if it's too sensitive an area, you can collect that in a in a um, its own tank and then take that off site for processing. Um, two two strategies for the same thing. Now, when when this container fills up uh, at the end of a season, or maybe it'll last more than a season, when it fills up, they're modular. So if you look over at this green thing. These, um, these carabiners and this, this turnbuckle loosens up and you can unclip these wires that are holding it in 
take off this whole lid, put the lid aside, and then the blue bin wheels out and you end up with a bin on its own, like this one here. The lid goes up top and the lid you'll see has ventilation on top of a little chimney. It's got four more of its own holes in there so the air that's coming in at the bottom and gradually percolating up through the compost pile will then be able to exit through this vent on top. They're all screened, of course, um, and, and that, that's critical. That's, that's one of the most critical things, getting excess moisture out, having the wood shavings or the bark mulch um, added regularly, and having a passage for air are the three most important things for the composting. Without all three of those, you don't get composting. You just, you just get um, buildup. So those three things happening are the perfect environment for the microbes that, that need to do the decomposing. And then at the end of the process, these are going to sit in their bin for a, a, a whole year, actually more than a year, um, because if one, one will be filling while the other one is resting. So it'll be a little over a season that they get to sit. So by the time that anyone has to remove compost from these, uh, it'll have already been maturing for an entire year before it, it has to be dealt with at all. Um, any questions about that? For your for your maintenance, in terms of like specifics that that you'll need to know, um, maybe I'll just point out the the things that we've gone over already today. Mm -hmm. Like like this lid here, it's a hinged lid, but in order to fit in the enclosure, we removed the uh, the lid and set it aside. So these little black things come out. The uh, the lid gets gets put in place and you nail it in just like this one is pegged in with these uh, with these guys um, what else oh for the quick disconnect fitting down here you have to um, in order to get it off you have to slide this bin all the way over to this block to get the room to disconnect that thing and wheel it out once it's disconnected you can cap it with the uh, with the little the little um, little banjo cap that's the same as same system as that. Uh, oh, the adding of the wood shavings, that, that really should happen every time someone uses it. So it'll be important to have the signs up that, that have the instructions and, and to figure out a, a good way to make it really convenient for people to refill the indoor shavings container when it's, when it's not full and keep the shavings dry wherever they are. Um, what else? That's most of it, right? Is there anything else? So you, you think with this system, we're getting a pretty good pathogen kill? Yeah. By the time we get over and empty it into the moldering bin? Yeah, yeah, you sure will. All of the, um, all the major intestinal diseases like, you know, like, like Giardia or, or um, dysentery or, or just stomach bugs, you know, <clears throat> whether it's a bacteria or whatever, um, those all go pretty quickly. Those go within, I think it's within a couple of months. And uh, at that temperature, typically, um, the one thing that you can have persisting is roundworms, helminths like, um, like uh, I'm mean, sorry, helminths like roundworms or or hookworms, mm -hmm. and those are very low prevalence, but it's possible someone might have that, um, and and so that's possible there could be something left even after a year, and the research shows it shows different levels of die-off in different studies, so it's not really clear um, exactly what. Know what the cutoff point is, so so definitely after you empty it, you know, wash your hands, wear gloves, wash your hands. Mm -hmm. um, there shouldn't be anything outrageous in there, but but it's not guaranteed sterile either. Mm -hmm. um, and then after after resting in the moldering bin, then you'll then you'll really have attenuation of of any roundworms might be in there. And I don't think there's any any um, any cutoff date for you know, for how long in a moldering toilet. That research I don't think has been done it's been done in other sorts of toilets mm -hmm. so you know I can't say after two years then then it's totally benign but definitely two years is a is a much heavier die-off than, uh, than than one year even yeah chances are we wouldn't be taking it out of that moldering bin at least at this site yeah 10 to 15 uh, years at this point I think so. that seven years is the longest that anyone's ever recorded a uh, roundworm egg surviving for okay. so, so that's good to put it in perspective and just to talk a little bit about why we have such a beefy structure here. Uh -huh. Th this location is a floodplain. The floodway is over there because we're out on the very edge of a huge meander um, trying to become an oxbow. <clears throat> During a what they call a hundred year flood event, uh, 
there's a chance that water could come up about 10 inches. So uh, what we've done, we've made this mobile so we could take it out outside of our paddling season. And we've also tethered it to some very hefty rocks just in case a rogue event was to occur during the season. Um, we'd have a, a stable structure that would stay in place and we wouldn't have any concern of losing the human waste uh, in the water. So uh, that's, that's why we've come up with this design. This location is uh, it's not necessarily unique to the trail, uh, but there are some criteria that make it important for us to, to um, meet the needs of the, 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 the seasonal effect and also uh, the potential for uh, floodwaters. Uh, the, the owner of, of this land has requested that our campsite be within 25 feet of the, uh, the high water line because this whole field out here is something that he, he hays. It's part of his income. Uh, and he's also, you know, kind enough to allow it to be a campsite on the Northern Forest Canoe Trail. Uh, so, you know, to, to kind of meet all of those demands, this is the system that we've come up with. And we've really been refining this, this, this system at this location because I feel like it's one of the more challenging ones that we have across the trail. And if we can build something that works here, we've got something that we can take and use in other locations as well. And as far as the maintenance piece, um, Abe was talking a little bit about the double chamber moldering box that we have up in the, uh, the high grounds and we could, we could take some film of that when, when we get up there.